Okay. Um, so Deirdre has done the introduction, but what she didn't tell you was that I was a GP for more years than I care to admit in a rural area in West Wicklow. This is Dunlavin. And um, I decided, if, you know, just to, to maybe change focus after 30 years and I upskilled in headaches and um, I'm really enjoying it. And I was always interested in migraine and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. We get the official things over. I have no financial interest or declaration to make in advance of this um, or any product that I mention. And the information is accurate and up to date to the best of my knowledge at this particular time. I just thought I'd mention in the beginning um, just about female hormones. I, I'm leaving out the men completely tonight and apologies for any of the men in the, the audience, although some of the general principles for migraine will be um, shared tonight. But really, we're just concentrating on the areas in yellow. But you know, there are so many areas for women and the migraine that affects them that it's just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to be educate yourself, no matter what age you are, if there's migraine in the family. Um, and migraine can start as young as eight. In fact, I had a mum there just on to me the other day, and she was actually on to me from casualty and had just read something. And when she said the recurrent abdominal pain in the small child in her daughter, oh my goodness, she said that's obviously related to her migraine. And never mind the fact that she was a colicky child. And they're all sometimes precursors. So we're talking about pregnancy and breastfeeding. So keep in mind maybe that sometimes colicky children can be a little bit more at risk of developing migraine in later life. In upskilling uh, to work in headaches, I, um, in conjunction with Dr. Martin Rutledge and Nurse Esther Tompkins, I was lead author on this document, Migraine Diagnosis and Management from a GP Perspective. And if your GP is a member of the Irish College of General Practitioners, they would have free access to this document. Initially, when this document was published in 2019, everybody had free access to it, including patients, but unfortunately, that's no longer the case. We have a few questions, and I think Deirdre has already addressed this there throughout the presentation. Just to remember that migraine is very common, like 42% of all women will have had a migraine. That means like almost one in two people will have had, almost one in two women will have had a migraine sometime in their life. Almost one in 10 people will have migraine. And I mean, Dr. Martin Rutledge reckons there's three quarters of a million people. And, and really, the really big thing is for women between 15 and 49, they're, they're teenagers, they're going through education, they're thinking about having a family, they're trying to work. I mean, this is a really productive time in their lives, and it's the highest cause of disability. And it, it's a very significant disability at these particular times. It's second to back pain for disability, non-fatal disability. I mean, back pain is pretty common and depression, but migraine is migraine is just up there with the back pain. And these are not Irish figures. This is worldwide, the WHO. So to go back to the subject in question tonight, um, you know, migraine and pregnancy. And I mean, less than 8% of people worsen in pregnancy, but really for those who worsen in pregnancy, it's just awful. And, and the best advice I can give you, if there's one thing you can take away, is have your migraine well controlled before you get pregnant. But really, almost one in two pregnancies are unplanned. So are you going to really have your migraine well controlled before you start? But that's what you should be thinking about. And then the sodium valproate and the topiramate, they're two drugs which are used to try and prevent migraine and help prevent it. They're contraindicated in pregnancy. So if you do happen to be one of those people with an unplanned pregnancy, they need to be stopped straight away. I haven't mentioned veniflexin here, but there's a little bit of debate about veniflexin, but by and large, veniflexin can be used if the benefit outweighs the risk. And we'll discuss benefit outweighing risk as we go ahead. And ideally, of course, you should perhaps discuss with your neurologist, uh, who's a headache specialist, uh, about getting pregnant. But really, the difficulties of getting an appointment uh, and 
with a neurologist is really difficult. And if you're fortunate enough that your GP has an interest in migraine, it might be wise to consult them. And particularly, hopefully, with the information and a direction I can send you tonight, you may be able to direct your GP and help your GP become more informed on the subject. In the document I produced there earlier, we have a small bit about breastfeeding and, and pregnancy in it, but this presentation tonight is more detailed. I do plan an update of that migraine document and I do plan to um, make it a bit more detailed. And, you know, all the audience here, you know, migraine is more than a headache. And as a, as a medical practitioner, I need a detailed, a detailed history um, when I'm talking to somebody with migraine. But really, I'm probably speaking to the people who know more about it than myself because I'm not a migraine sufferer, but we've migraine in the family. And you've seen a relative with migraine. You probably know it's migraine before you, you even get there. And you know that the migraine can last, attacks can last up to a week. And in medical terms, we talk about the prodrome, which is in the beginning, and the postdrome. And in between it, you have this headache that can last three days. And my goodness, you're really miserable. And then you're another three or four days and you're recovering from it. But you could be a few days beforehand and you have the next stiffness. And, and then the other part, 20% of people will have aura. Now, and, and this is where I come back to my time as a general practitioner. Um, uh, I would say in the late 1990s, when the triptans came out and they were a wonderful thing for, for, for um, migraine. The Migraine Association of Ireland produced this very nice headache. Um, and I'm sorry you, for those of you who can't see the top of it. Uh, I'll probably, it's a comparison of headache characteristics. And, you know, migraine tension type headaches, a medication overuse headache, a new daily persistent, and they're compared. Now, the big one here is the tension type headache and the migraine. And over the surge, over the years, I had this um, exact, well, not this exact picture, but pretty close to this, this picture in the, on the wall. And somebody might come in with the ingrown toenail and maybe I just, they might be just waiting for something and they'd be looking at the headache characteristics and they'd say, well, I thought I had tension headache, but I look here now and I think, gosh, it's migraine. And I'd ask them a few questions. And yes, quite often it was migraine. So, and this hung in my office and I have to give the Migraine Association great credit for, for producing this document. And I, um, I've updated it with Dr. Rutledge and it was in our newer, in our newer document. Um, what really used to make the diagnosis was migraine comes on quickly and you, you don't want to do anything and you want to stay still and in a dark room. So this is really the girl tearing her hair out and apology to the men who are there because I'm sure you're tearing your hair out, but it does really make it real for me, but it's more than a headache. It can affect neck pain, it's stomach, you know, generally you're out of sorts. I just want to say a few words about migraine with aura. And, and this is what the aura looks like. It's a kind of a shimmering that comes on to your vision. And it's only present in 20% of people. Bearing in mind that only 8% of people get worse with migraine in pregnancy. There's not too many that get migraine with aura. But migraine with aura has a non-predictable pattern in pregnancy. So if you have migraine with aura, please try and be attentive and be, have, have your migraine down to a minimum um, beforehand. Unfortunately, topiramate is quite good for migraine with aura, but topiramate is contraindicated with migraine in, with, uh, with aura. We, we'll come back to that later. So the triggers. Now, triggers are a complex a complex area. And triggers is, is really defined as something that comes on causes the headache, but if you take it away, the headache goes away. And that's usually how it is in migraine. But it's a little bit more complex because if you have neck pain for two or three days, that can be a trigger. But equally, you might get neck pain when you get the headache as part of the prodrome, just before the headache comes on, even in 20 minutes beforehand. If you're tired for a couple of days, that can bring on a headache. Equally, in the day or two before the headache, you might just get tired. Just in the very immediate, or it can be afterwards. 
like neurologically, we're all different. And that's why everybody gets different symptoms. And this is seen very through all neurological illnesses. It's not unique to migraine. There are other neurological illnesses I'm uh, aware of and familiar with. And neurologically, we're all different. And the same illness affects people in different ways. The triggers, now cheese, chocolate and red wine. And in the 1990s, we thought they were they were triggers. But in actual fact, we now feel their cravings in the aura phase. So for some people, the red wine is a trigger. But for more people, it's a craving. How do you know? Well, you've just got a bit of trial and error. I just want to point out here in particular, stress is implicated as a trigger in 80% of migraine hormones in 65. Now, particularly in migraine with, in pregnancy, really, we, we can't do anything about the hormone triggers. And we'll come back to that again. So the things we've got to really concentrate on are the stress and the not eating. And of course, pregnancy, in particular, rather than breastfeeding, has another trigger with the not eating. If you consider that in pregnancy, it's not uncommon to have a bit of nausea, as poor Kate Middleton knew at one stage. The weather, there's nothing we can do about. The sleep disturbances. Well, we have to look at the sleep, the perfume, the odors and the stress. And we have to do the best we can about the not eating if we're pregnant or considering that we might like to become pregnant. And then what if you have a few triggers at the one time? Well, the menstruation, you, maybe you're pregnant, the bit of stress at work, a late night, a missed meal. So, I mean, it's really just very difficult. It becomes very difficult and, and you're vomiting with the pregnancy, you're stressed, and then the migraine comes on and then the vomiting gets worse. And my goodness, it really gets into a vicious circle. So really, you have to preempt this and you have to mind yourself if you have migraine and you're thinking about pregnancy or you are pregnant. So uh, does chocolate um, cause migraine? And the answer is no, it's now considered a craving. But I do want to make a, a word here about typical food triggers in migraine. For some, as I said before, it's the red wine, but the MSG, the monosodium gluconate, is really, it's quite a, a common trigger in Chinese takeaway, canned vegetables, canned foods. So really, it's got to be, I'm afraid, ladies, it's the good vegetables, none of the canned food, none of the takeaways. You know, you've got to maybe really get down to it. And Tesco delivery, we've all got more used to it maybe with COVID maybe the Tesco delivery and really Little and Aldi over the years have done wonderful thing for, ve for vegetables and fresh vegetables and fruit. Because when I was at that age of pregnancy, really there wasn't as much um, variety and the cost of fruit and vegetables was quite prohibitive, particularly a few nice strawberries or raspberries or, you know, something like that. So the next one then is the ideal lifestyle for those with migraine uh, who are trying to conceive pregnant. And it's a regular body clock. And we'll see in some of the information from the NHS that really and truly, if you're up 30 minutes later in the morning, like if your normal time is getting up at eight o'clock and you leave it till half eight on a Saturday morning, that can be enough in a susceptible individual to trigger a migraine. Dr. Anne McGregor is in the UK, a headache expert. She's really keen that all those with migraine have their breakfast at home, and particularly if you're pregnant, and that you drink the two litres of water. Keep the coffee to a minimum. Unchanging stress. Well, I don't know how we'd manage that in the COVID pandemic, but you really have to sit down and think about the stress. And it's not possible to keep the uh, female hormones unchanged. I have particular empathy with those who have been through IVF because the swings in, hor in hormones through IVF are quite substantial and can affect migraine quite significantly. The food pyramid for pregnancy is a little bit different from our standard food, food pyramid. And there I want to point out that meat, poultry, fish, you need two to three servings per day. The fruit, you need two to four servings and the vegetables is three to five servings. Now, the sugars, the fats, the sweets, you're to use very sparingly. 
And I would like to emphasize here a little bit of important thing is iron intake in pregnancy because the iron tablets can be make you nauseated. So when you are having an iron rich meal, and for most of us that will be meat, you should take some vitamin C. If you take some vitamin C, which are iron rich foods, like the meat, the poultry, never mind the liver, if you could stomach it during pregnancy, but you know, it's always worth thinking about. Um, it will help to keep your iron level up. And that's really important. If you have tea or coffee uh, with your iron rich foods, it will reduce your iron absorption. Now, uh, for those on a vegetarian diet, there are some um, foods that are particularly more easily absorbed than others but you do need to keep in mind you need a good iron intake and I do feel it's important to get your iron level checked you know reasonably regularly because you do you're, you're between migraine and pregnancy it's difficult but then if you let your iron count go down on top of all that you know it's it's just more difficult to cope with never mind if you had another small child but we'll, we'll deal with that later. <clears throat> So the International Federation for Obstetrics and Gynecology at this website have a particular questionnaire. So it's pretty much as I've said there. Uh, and, and if you take the website there, you, you can, you'll be able to see it for yourself. They're saying less than five days a week, you should have the snacks, the cakes and the pastry. And that is particularly for those with nausea. Just because you have the nausea, you're not doing yourself any favors having too much cakes, snacks, and, and the like. And uh, this is the questionnaire. <clears throat> so let's reflect for a minute what happens with a normal menstrual cycle. Now, um, this is a normal person that has a 28 day cycle. And you can see in the middle of the month, the estrogen is at the highest level. This is the time you conceive. And then as the period comes, the estrogen level drops. And there does tend to be a slightly increased amount of migraine at this particular time of the month. So basically, if you could keep your estrogen level up, it should uh, help prevent migraine. Now, we won't get into tonight how you'd keep the estrogen level up for those who are not becoming pregnant. But the theory is, if you keep your estrogen level up, and you'll see in the next slide, uh, well, just the one after that, we, we just come to that in a minute. If you look at this slide, you can see this is the normal variation, the up and down that I showed you. Um, this is the perimenopause where there's terrible fluctuations, but that's not what we're dealing with tonight. And this is where I spared the thought for those teenagers. But life is improving after the menopause and uh, we should keep that in mind and it'll give you something to look forward to. So in pregnancy then, as I said, we're starting there at that you know, it's only at the high level, but the estrogen stays kind of stable. So for the first little bit of time, you might get away and you might not have too many problems. And then as the estrogen level rises, it should be a protective um, influence. And that's why less than 8% of people develop, uh, the less than 8% of people, their migraine doesn't worsen. Now, uh, partrition is where the baby is born and this is what happens after the baby is born but we'll deal with that in more detail later in the in the um, presentation so <clears throat> women with stable migraine only having two days <clears throat> uh, having the two days before the period or the first three days of period they've got what we call pure menstrual migraine and they often see an improvement in their migraine but <clears throat> you know their migraine needs to be stable for them to see an improvement. And migraine with aura, as we said before, follows an unpredictable course. Migraine coming on for the first time in pregnancy, it's really an anxious time for everyone. And it can pose, it can be difficult to diagnose and it can be hard to believe. And, and there's where maybe it's the diet is actually causing the problem. And you can see here from what I've said to you that the Pregnancy affects nausea and can cause a reduction in what you're eating, but also um, that can precipitate the migraine. So it, it kind of makes a bit of sense, I hope, to people. And, and we're just coming back to this, the regular body clock, the, the ideal thing you need to do. So even if you're considering becoming pregnant and you have migraine, this is what you need to do. 
and you need to take, of course, your folic acid. So this is a question we got in. I suffer from bad migraines. I'm six weeks pregnant and I'm getting bad attacks. Can I get an injection? Well, I'm afraid there's no magic cure and no magic, magic, but there's lots of options. So when I get a question like this, the first thing I, 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 I deal with the first thing I do, but we, we've covered this already. The first 13 weeks are most difficult from the nausea of pregnancy, but from the migraine perspective, the estrogen is rising, so it may help. <laughs> but if you do get vomiting and you have migraine and you are pregnant, really you need to look for medical attention early, early in play. You need to try and avoid the dehydration and don't skip the meals, stay out of work if necessary and keep stress to a minimum and try and get a good night's sleep and get up at the same time and go to the bed at the same time. These are the first things. In the second and third trimester, you know, people often improve a little bit more because they haven't the nausea. But what I find in a second pregnancy, if, if the first pregnancy, they might improve. Sometimes in a second pregnancy, your sleep is more disturbed and disturbed sleep is an independent risk factor for, for migraine. So. A first pregnancy, you might have, you might do okay. A second pregnancy, it could be completely different. It all depends upon what stage you're in your life at. If you've decided to do a master's degree and move house in the first trimester or the first pregnancy, that's not going to do you any good. But if you're on your second pregnancy doing a master's degree and an MBA and, you know, trying to move house, you're, please don't take on any new projects. It's just, it's too difficult. So when I would have somebody, if she was 26 weeks pregnant, um, sorry, that's a bit high. Um, so she's 26 weeks pregnant with migraine with aura, currently not taking any medication as she was pregnant. What she can you do? And these are the questions I'd ask her. What are your circumstances? Are you already a mother? Are you working? Who's preparing the dinner? And I think this is really important because the nausea of pregnancy is worse if you prepare the food. And the nausea gets worse and worse as you prepare the food. And by the time you have the food in front of you, you're just not fit for anything. So if you can either, you only need a small little bit of food, but if you could get something nice and tasty and nutritious into you, it's worth anything. And the medication, we'll talk about the medication now. <clears throat> so this is the kind of medication we give to people if you're not pregnant. But unfortunately, there's very little trials. The only, the, in the, 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 there's some good information for the ibuprofen. Paracetamol is generally considered to be safe. <laughs> Sumatriptan, there's more information on the Sumatriptan than there is on any other triptan. And anti-sickness tablets can be taken. And if, if we go to the NHS in the Oxfordshire clinical commissioning group, you know, they talk, the, the first thing you do in pregnancy is you look at the lifestyle, you look at the sleep, and, and here they're saying some patients find that sleeping even 30 minutes longer than migraines causes the problem. Disrupted mealtimes, aggressive diets, regular mealtimes, encourage regular mealtimes to avoid fluctuations, and for migraineurs, the morning sickness exacerbating migraines means that you know you'll have a lower threshold and particularly your gp will have a lower threshold but but any medication taken during pregnancy metoclopramide or clomazine it has to be a joint decision between you and your gp so for pregnancy you can take the paracetamol you can take the ibuprofen or the naproxen between 12 and 24 weeks now we'll come back to the half-life in due course. So we will, we'll just come back to that. Sumatriptan is relatively safe, but as I said, there's no data about other ones. The problem is that no pharmaceutical company will recommend, recommend, recommend medication in pregnancy. As you know, in the literature, it says consult your doctor. So if you want to make a decision, you have to talk, yourself and your doctor need to get down and talk about it. And, and we hear this great sentence of risk versus value. And, and very kindly, the uh, Oxfordshire Clinical Commissioning Group have discussed this. Um, 
no, I, I know perhaps maybe you might like to read through this. Um, most migrants improve during pregnancy as a general rule, but one in 10 get a little bit worse normally in the first trimester. Several migraines can have negative consequences for the mother and the fetus, including poor nutrition, dehydration, sleep deprivation, increased stress and depression. And there, by the poor nutrition, if you find you're losing weight, it can be serious. I mean, it can cause high blood pressure. Preeclampsia is the protein in the urine, the swelling of the ankles. And, and stroke, which is very rare. And I mean, in preeclampsia, you could have an epileptic fit. So if your migraine is very badly controlled, um, you know, you don't want to develop these things because it'll have an effect on the fetus. So sometimes having no medicine at all for migraine is not acceptable. And the benefits of treating outweigh the risks. So this is where they talk about the benefit of treatment outweighing the risks. So I hope that's clear to people. Any medicine you have in pregnancy is unlicensed. <clears throat> so there is this medicines website below, which will talk about the medications and it's written in layman's uh, language. So I think that's a really important slide and really important information. You know, when you're worried about the, the, the medicines and, and worried about taking them, particularly in pregnancy. <clears throat> uh, just take it. If you're having migraine days, headache days on eight to 10 days per month, or if they're not responding to these acute medications, that's when you would consider taking a preventative medication. And there are preventative medications and preventative treatment. We've already discussed being in good health and having the prevention early, but there are medications which are internationally accepted as being without too much risk. There again, you need to weigh the benefit and the risk in pregnancy. <clears throat> um, obviously, you should see your your um, your neurologist or headache specialist. But there again, it's difficult. And often general practitioners who are well used to dealing with people in pregnancy can well advise you a little bit. Aspirin 75 milligrams from week 12 is now considered a standard of care in pregnancy and migraine. Propanolol. Now, the, the experts with the NHS in Oxfordshire are recommending 80 to 240 milligrams, but often a lower dose, 10 to 20 milligrams twice a day may be helpful. And for those who can't, whose sleep is disturbed and have migraines, amitriptyline is a very good drug. Uh, it has a long half-life and we'll come back to that so it's a little bit more problematic. The propanolol, the half-life is shorter and it comes out of the system quicker. Um, the propanolol half-life is three to six hours and the half-life for the amitriptyline is 10 to 28 hours. So if you were taking these coming up towards delivery date, you might want to go off the amitriptyline a little bit earlier than the propanolol. The choice of preventative depends upon your general health and other issues. As you saw there, the propanolol is contraindicated in aspirin. <clears throat> and, you know, migrainers are very sensitive to drugs, but sometimes even a small dose of one of those drugs works quite well. Medication is only 30 to 50 percent of the answer. And we always like to start at a low dose because people with migraine are so sensitive to medication. In the literature from the Oxfordshire group, they're saying you may get a response in six weeks, but normally it's accepted. It takes three months for an improvement. And there you may say, my goodness, is it worthwhile taking anything at all or the pregnancy will be over? Um, treatment failure in, in international circles is defined as a lack of response at the highest maximum tolerated dose after three months. <clears throat> But you play a very important part in prevention of migraine yourself with the lifestyle. And, and usually neither amitriptyline or um, propanolol work in the presence of medication overuse. The first line preventatives in, in Ireland when you're not pregnant actually include amitriptyline and propanolol. 
you know, you may not take as large a dose as you might if you weren't pregnant, but they are worth considering and they are good drugs and have proven a very useful over the years. Candesartan is another option and that's used in treatment of blood pressure. So it might be worth talking to your cardiologist if you have blood pressure and migraine that candesartan might be a useful drug, but there the risk to the fetus and the, I'm not sure if they're, I'm pretty sure there's no real work done in the candesart. There again, you could consult the medicines website that I mentioned earlier, and it may be able to help you further. There are other medical interventions which are worth considering in pregnancy, and they include the greater occipital nerve block and neuromodulation, which we'll discuss now. So, the woman who comes in at 26 weeks and she's having the migraine with aura and she's not taking any medication. Well, she definitely could do the lifestyle medication, the lifestyle changes. She could have the tryptin discussing the benefits versus the risk. Now, if she has migraine with aura, she'll take the tryptin just as the headache phase starts. And she has three preventatives there. She is 26 weeks. So there's only another 14 weeks left in the pregnancy, but really it certainly might be worthwhile considering taking something. The greater occipital nerve block, and you can see in the picture where the greater occipital nerve is, and this is the area you inject it. Um, it's, a, it's a good treatment. Uh, it helps the migraine by numbing the greater occipital nerve. It can come into effect within 15 minutes. It can last for weeks to months. It's preferable only to have it a couple of times in your lifetime because it, it, it can cause atrophy of the skin there. But for an emergency situation, maybe with an unplanned pregnancy, it's useful. It's quite useful. This is an electronic device. It's a neuromodulation device. It's, it delivers little tiny jolts. You can use it when you have an attack or you can use it on a regular basis to try and prevent an attack. Just some of the non-pharmacological details, and, I, and here I'll bring in Deirdre in short. Sometimes even something as simple as a nice cube on the roof of your mouth or a cold pack. The wheat cushions in the microwave, because heat and cold are very individualistic. Some people find they do better with something cold, and some people find they do better with something hot. The micro cap, and Deirdre might mention this as well, people just are really impressed with it and then there's a stick which contains the peppermint and lavender and this you roll on to the template roll on and it's very useful in pregnancy in in breastfeeding you might skip the peppermint you might have to skip this one because it contains peppermint tiger balm lotion also pretty good and pretty good for those people who trouble have trouble with their neck and then there's cool and soothe pads and i'm reliably told they're available in boots and not too expensive so there's quite a few things you can do there's always the ginger tea and the peppermint tea in pregnancy only the essential oils and I'll, I'll leave this with Deirdre. I'll hand over there to you, Deirdre, uh, to do a bit of, to talk about the essential oils. Thanks, Mary. That's brilliant. Thanks. Um, yeah, as Mary was saying, there are a few non-pharmacological options and more what they call natural options that can be used. But you have to be really, really careful because some of them, they have to be specific for pregnancy or specifically approved for pregnancy, breastfeeding and for infants as well. So um, especially with essential oils, first of all, speak to your doctor if you can or a practitioner, a, a good practitioner who is who is qualified and you know that they're reliably, that you're fairly sure they're reliably qualified. Only use the oils, approved for pregnancy breastfeeding and for use with infants because they can have uh, effects and you just want to avoid anything don't use anything undiluted directly on your skin or on your baby's skin um do a patch test on your own skin like you know that with with hair dyes and other things where we're always told to do patch tests before we try them don't go over the recommended number of drops they're 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 given out or they're you're they're Doses are in drops for the reason that they have to be, they're only very small amounts of oil have to be used. So don't exceed the number of drops that are recommended for a particular oil. 
don't use them near your eyes at all and don't whatever you do take them internally you don't ingest them um some are recommended for for bathing and that kind of thing but again you have to be very careful because they touch your skin so you have to just make sure that you'd be able to tolerate them and like i said only certain oils are regarded as safe for pregnancy breastfeeding and um infants um other things that can be good now mary mentioned a few things like the microcap the microcap is can be particularly good for people who find cold helpful um it's basically it's it's a kind of a, a cap that encases your head um and there's a visor on the front as well to block out the light and you keep it in the fridge or the freezer between uses depending on how cold you like it and that kind of thing. And it can be really good because it blocks out the light and it does encase your head in cold. Some people find kind of, it's bizarre, but we've we've heard this quite a few times over the years from people on our information line that sometimes combining the, the micro cap on your head with your feet in a basin of warm water and some again, you could maybe put something like lavender oil in the warm water if you can tolerate the smell of the oils and if you can tolerate if the lavender is OK mm -hmm. for you. The kind of combination between hot and cold can sometimes help a lot. And I don't know why, but there is there's a, a thing about the heat and the cold, whether they distract each other or whether they divert each other. I don't know, but they have been known to be helpful for some people, particularly during pregnancy, because they're non pharmaceutical and you don't have to worry too much about side effects or anything like that. Uh, OK, so preventative therapy. Um... Well, you can, you can, um, the good sleep hygiene, the melatonin in our bodies is uh, helped by the amount of time you're out early in the morning. And if you could keep your melatonin levels up, it might help your sleep and really a little bit of fresh air, even to sit outside if you can't walk. We need the healthy diet. This is the preventative therapy in migraine, the ginger tea. The tinted glass, and Deirdre has already mentioned that, and the adequate intake of iron, vitamin D, um, riboflavin. Now, an adequate magnesium, don't overdo the magnesium. And the melatonin for sleep, but that might be risk. For, that would be something you would speak to your doctor about to see if the benefit would outweigh the risk. So in summary, when you get that migraine, sit in the dark room, things to apply to your head, hermit remedies and relaxation techniques. And that's even before you reach for the Panadol. So I think that covers um, pregnancy fairly well. I will invite you, I think Deirdre has invited you to put some questions in the chat if I haven't covered them already. Um, but we'll, we'll be discussing um, a little bit of a crossover with the, um, with the breastfeeding. Uh, I'm just not sure if I see something there at the minute. Um, Ah, so there's a question about breastfeeding. So we might just go to the breastfeeding and I might let Deirdre address that question. Um, there's one about peppermint oil and the breastfeeding. So um, the estrogen level usually remains high every if you're breastfeeding every six hours or oftener. And this usually prevents, helps prevent migraines from recurring. But unfortunately, half of the migraine patients will have a recurrence of their attacks within one month of giving breast birth, if not breastfeeding. And this is what happens. This is a slightly different one. The estrogen is the red line. And really, just as the baby is born, the estrogen just drops off completely and you're back down. In fact, I heard a neurologist say that they could see somebody getting a migraine in the delivery ward because they were just so sensitive. Now, the acute treatment for breastfeeding is different than pregnancy. The paracetamol is perfect. They're, they really are advising you to avoid the ibuprofen and the naproxen. The sumatriptan is present in breast milk, and it's, you know, but it's a little bit more tolerable than the non-steroids. Whereas you remember the non-steroids, they said, well, they're not so bad in pregnancy. But they would recommend in pregnancy and in breastfeeding to take a lower dose than you would usually take if you weren't breastfeeding. 
And just to go into the half-life, I mentioned I would do it. The, the half-life of ibuprofen is one to two hours. So that means after two hours, if you've taken 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, you've only down to 200 milligrams. And the positive effect of the 400 milligrams will last the four to six hours. So what you could do is you could feed the baby and then you could take your ibuprofen. And by the time the next feed would be due, you know, hopefully you'd be a bit better. But of course, if you weren't that bit better, you could possibly think about if you had some breast milk in the freezer stored from when you're well, you could consider that. The sumatriptan, the half-life is two hours. Now, they do recommend you withhold the breast milk for 12 hours, but really if the half hour is, the half-life is two hours, you know, there won't be that much um, in, in your system after two hours and, and maybe even in four hours, so you could consider taking it. But then the other side is the sumatriptan doesn't really work unless you take it early in the attack. And that's where the problem really occurs. So that's why it's so important to do everything you can to try and keep yourself well. And as I said before, the pharmaceutical company will not recommend any breast, recommend, recommend medication in pre breastfeeding. So it's really, you've really got to try and make the decision with the information, maybe that knowing the half-life, knowing if it's excreted in the breast milk and how long it stays in your system. Now, prevention. Um, it's accepted to take the propanolol. You won't take aspirin, no aspirin this time because aspirin is associated with Ray's syndrome. The propanolol, but the propanolol, as we said, is contraindicated with those who have asthma. The amitriptyline, the amitriptyline, what they say is it's excreted in breast milk and it's often too small a dose to be harmful. Bearing in mind, if you took the amitriptyline, maybe after at eight o'clock when the baby would have fed, the half-life, you would have had the benefit of in your system, the half-life would be reduced. And, you know, in a short space of time, you might be fine. And you could also consider the greater occipital nerve injection and the cephaly neuromodulation device as a treatment in breastfeeding. I just put this slide up to say to you, this is when people are given medication and we'll say the proportion of patients, you've, they're all taking their medication in the beginning. And this is time, 100 days is about three months. By and large, almost after a month, only slightly more than a half of people are taking medication. A month's medication, if you remember, I said, some people are saying after six weeks, you can judge an effect. But at three months, you really need to be taking the medication for three months before you can say whether it's working. A diary is essential. It's essential for me to monitor your progress, to know how you are. Because when I see you every three months, if you haven't got a three month diary, I really don't know how you are. It's so important. And there again, the Migraine Association led the way there. We now have migraine buddy for the younger people the phone app but i i kind of prefer this one i find i can just see it straight away but this is usually what i well it's not usually at this stage for the people who know me but sometimes this is what i get when i'm looking for a migraine diary i just wanted to make a, a few words about the marina coil and just to say no study has been carried out to know whether it affects migraine or not and there's a considerable disagreement among top ed European medical experts about whether it helps migraine or not. So for some people, it has no effect, but for others, it does make their migraine worse. And the difference, we've covered this <clears throat> between migraine associated only with menstruation and ordinary migraine. The attacks uh, associated with menstruation are more severe, last longer, and triptans don't work as well. But there are some long acting triptans which work well if you're one of those one of those seven to 15 percent who has pure menstrual migraine only at period time. <clears throat> so in summary, if you're trying to conceive or or if you're pregnant, stop your sodium valparate, pay particular uh, attention to your diet, your drinking enough, your sleep, a bit of exercise and don't take on any new projects.
think about alternative treatment and let your GP know there is information from the NHS, which is a reliable source on pregnancy, migraine in, in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Another very valuable site is patient.co.uk, where you will find valuable information about migraine. How many silmetriptan are safe to take without over-medicating? And we've touched on this before. It's really four to six days per month only. If you're taking it on more than 10 days per month, or if you're taking the paracetamol on 15 or more days per month, you're considered to have medication overuse, which can lead to medication overuse headache. And for those who are vomiting, I always like to remind people about suppositories. I like to remind you about the nasal, um, the nasal triptans, which um, this is the nasal triptan. This is the suppository and the injection. Avoid morphine and opiate based medications because they really lead to medication overuse and always consider prevention if you're needing a lot of painkillers for migraine. Migraine on a budget is available online because it really is difficult between keeping you out of work and all the different things. And there again, it's the same general principles, keep hydrated, exercise, the relaxation and concentrate on taking the cheaper drugs. So I'd like to thank you, finish by thanking the Migraine Association for asking me to speak. Um, I'm happy to take questions and comments. And if you want to find out more about me, I have a website, www.marycarney.eu.